thank you, thank you, thank you for doing this. Um, so, so I'm I'm Craig. Um, of course, like we've been in contact. Um, Hi, Craig. Sorry for all the mis miscommunication, but um, it's it's great that you were able to do it, do this. That's fine. Coronavirus has uh, discombobulated everything. It's changed everything. Yeah. As we start off, um, I just want to check in and see uh, how are you doing with everything. Um, I'm good. Doing well. Yeah. Keeping busy here in the house. Going a little stir crazy, but I'm doing well. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's good to hear. That's really good to hear. Great. Yeah, well, I, when I, as I was raised, I was born and raised always being interested in theater and performing. Um, but it wasn't until high school when I first saw this man who gave a poetry workshop. It was poetry and storytelling as a workshop that he presented. That was the first time I'd seen that. And I was stunned by it. I was like, wow. And immediately was drawn into that. The, for a second that I saw it. It felt so good and I started to find my own natural uh, skills through that and that's what started my poetic journey. Mm -hmm. and that continued through high school and then when I went to college, I, I stopped. I had just a group of two or three friends with whom we would kind of riff on little, we'd do little comic storytelling and visual storytelling for comedic values for ourselves, and that was it. Uh, until I graduated from college, I went to grad school, and again, during grad school, I didn't do any poetry at that time either. And then I wanna say it was maybe when I was 28 years old, just a few years after college, that one of my friends asked me, he, he told my former girlfriend, now wife, uh, that I had good signing and asked if I would participate. And I said, you know, I was too embarrassed. I was very shy at that time. I was unwilling to step to the stage at that point because I was too shy about it. It was something I shared just intimately with my friends in terms of that expression. But then finally I gave in and signed a poem and some storytelling there. Uh, and my girlfriend then and my now wife was like, you need to get on stage after I had shown her that. Um, so she was persuasive. And that is where I first stepped to the stage of ASL Slam. At that time, it was under a different name. It was called ASLAN, Aslan Storytelling. And it was hosted by Bob Pullman at the Bowery Poetry Cafe. And he had helped found it there back in 2005. And he had encouraged me to come to the stage. So I got on stage there first, just for three or four minutes. And then I stepped back into the audience. I would always stand all the way in the back at the bar to chat with friends and sort of casually watch the performance while I was talking with friends. And I, but then they kept begging me and kept trying to pull me onto the stage to get me up there. And over time, after a couple of years beyond that, I started to go to the stage more and more and step up there and get more comfortable. And, and then it became a home for me, yeah. a place where I felt like I could express myself. So then after another few years, my friend who was hosting moved away and he wanted me to take over for him. And that's when the name changed to ASL Slam. We changed the name, we changed the format at that time. Up until that point, it had been very much the same as the idea uh, as they do for hearing poetry slams. We very much just borrowed that idea as a poetry slam. Uh, we added in more additional activities so improv, like whose line is it anyway, that kind of thing, and other concepts to diversify the content and to get more ASL-related activities occurring on stage for the deaf audience. So that was some of the change that occurred, and it was a hit. 
it just continued to grow. But then at the same time, when we added more and more improv as it went on, I love improv, I love just creating poetry on the spot there. That's how I develop it, you know, my body of work. Oh, sorry, rather, that was the interpreter's error. What he's saying is I develop my body of work at home and I work on that and crafting that, but I also take inspiration from the uh, improv, improvised work that I do on stage. And now it's been going for 15 years, 15 years of ASL slam. So there you go. Yeah, so for me, my own personal experience, uh, I had stage fright. Well, I was, I was shy, I had a little bit of the, the nerves and the anxiety about that, about what people would think about my poetry and my self-expression. And then two things happened. One was that I realized that this space was a space where I had free therapy so-called, right? I didn't have to go to therapy and pay for therapy. I could come to stage and have it for free to express myself there. Uh, that was something I realized over time and that helped me develop a comfort with it. And then I also had this perspective previously that everything must be perfect before I would step to the stage. And then I changed from that to a perspective of needing to have fun, to just enjoy myself on stage, to go out there and just play ball, you know? Yeah. Like you go out to play basketball just to have fun and you get better at it as you play it, right? The same with anything like that. So that was a point. I had to go out there and have fun and play with it and that would help me develop my skills. And then also the audience as well. I learned a lot just from the audience, watching the audience's responses and reactions and studying what they were doing, uh, how they would respond to my performances. This is my son. So I would study the audience and their, how they'd react to my pieces and, you know, based on my performance and the games and the activities that we did. Some of them they'd like or they wouldn't like, and that would help me to modify what we were doing to improve the games to make them better. Uh, and some of the ideas were given to me by the audience, and that helped me to, you know, we'd test them out in the games and the activities, so we would just accept those gifts from the audience. And the more we went on with the years of this, the more games we built into our repertoire for improv and so on. But uh, same thing with me as a poet. I saw that. I was able to build my poetry and my technique, um, like moving into slow motion or going faster, modifying the rhythm and the, the rhyme to it uh, based on audience reaction helped me to really improve my craft as well. But the point of the real perspective change that helped me the most was just knowing that I had to have fun and to just get into it and find a flow state in my mind where I was just fully involved in it. Just get into that flow tunnel and uh, people would be able to see us in the flow. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so expression for me is just a, it's really important. It's a, it's an expressive medium for sign. Poetry is that. So if we look at the past history of, you know, myself from how I grew up, you know, I was trained repeatedly told that I had to speak. Uh, it's called an oral education. I was forbidden from signing. I wasn't allowed to sign at home with my hearing parents. I was told that I had to use my voice and I had to keep improving on speech. That was a heavy focus during my upbringing. And I was deprived of my native language through that upbringing. So I didn't have any expression in that. So finding my own freedom of expression uh, was something that was blocked at that time. So then over time I realized as I found it, as I found my native language of expression, that led to poetry. And so the poetry was another space of sort of freedom of speech for me. And once you have that freedom of expression, 
once I had that in sign language, that led to so much more. It led to poetry, it led to storytelling. It was accessing that freedom of expression that led to those things for me. Yeah. You know, I actually gave a TEDx talk that relates very much to this, TEDx Vienna, um, where I discussed that a bit. The, for my uh, poetry that I do, it's very much in a, what we call a visual vernacular. That uh, is accessible to deaf people generally. Um, but then I noticed that there is a couple of mediums, right? Uh, that, that visual vernacular is similar to music. So I started bringing the two together, visual vernacular poetry with music, and that went really well. That was one way that we have, have bridged the gap by working together with those hearing musicians. So uh, in a medium where they follow my poetry, where they follow my sign language, so that we're synchronized starting on my end, from my side, and that's been really successful. And that has created a bridge to the outer community, to the hearing community out there for them to see and be like, wow, just see the beauty of the language and the depth of it, the richness of it, to see that it's not just a language for communication, but that it has these, that it's an expressive art form. That's a good question. Yeah, so uh, there are very, two very common misconceptions that we encounter. The first one out of the gate is that people look at American Sign Language as a gestural, as a system of gestures. And that's not correct. It has its own grammar. It has its own parameters. It's five different parameters, orientation, movement, uh, facial expression, the uh, palm orientation and all of those as components of the language, it has its own depth and complexity to it, right? So that's one misconception that we encounter repeatedly that we have to explain that people don't uh, realize or understand very often. Uh, and that was more in the past. But now what we see is that more and more people think that American Sign Language is a universal language. So people use the same language no matter where they're from in the world. But that's a misconception as well. Each country has its own sign language. Like so, for example, in England, they have their own sign language. You know, ironically, we speak and write the same language as them, English, right? But British Sign Language is different from American Sign Language. BSL and American Sign Language aren't compatible. We have there's also LSF, the language of signs of France, LSF, um, and there are different sign languages in every country around the world. A lot of people are uh, shocked to learn that that's the case. And one of the goals of ASL SLAM is to show the world that ASL is not just used for communication, but that it has all this variety to it as a medium. And we do that through poetry and storytelling through the visual vernacular, through comedy, music, or synch synchronizing with music. And uh, we work through all the different genres of expression in order to get all of those arts together in one place to show all the depth and richness of it, backwards, forwards, front and back. Sign language is Poetry, but it's a sign language poetry is spatial. It's not linear. It uses a three-dimensional space. Oof. Okay. Ah, all right. That's a good question. I'm gonna have to think about it. So in terms of hearing produced stories, I've been most drawn into the story of Moses. Yeah. In Egypt and how they like 
you know, their land was colonized and how they fought back. Like I was really drawn into that story in the Bible. And uh, I translated that into a visual sign language from the Torah, with the beard, right? And you can see him walking with the staff. I really love that story. So I took that and translated it into, translated it into sign language. So that is a story that's you know loaned or taken from uh, hearing stories and put into sign language. But I think of I think of original content in sign language. I like Birds of a Feather by Ben Bahan. It's a story that he came up with that has uh, these this metaphor and message hidden within it. It's about a group of birds. They're visually described with their beaks and their little clique, and they have this egg that comes into their family that has, uh, the bird that hatches out of it has this different beak, and it's the one bird that stands out from the rest of the family, and it is a representation, a metaphor for the deaf person who grows up in the hearing family, right? So maybe all the rest of the family speaks, and they are constantly trying to conform to that, but because they have a different beak, they have to eat different food. Right? Maybe they, ha they have to eat fruit instead of seeds or beans like the rest of the family. So they're constantly trying to fit in and join in and conform to that greater society of their, of their family in that story. That was a story that uh, I always think of. It's a great story for the community. Really, you know, over the last uh, 10 years or 12, 12 years since I took over hosting it, uh, you know, we began, there were 15 people in the audience often to what it is now. We have 150 people in the audience on average. And just being called to go perform at other places from Scandinavia, Norway, Sweden, all of the Scandinavian countries, to Russia and Japan, to Cuba, all of these places have traveled around in the world with SLAM. That's something that I'm proud of is the people asking us, asking me how we did this. And asking how they could create a similar model in their own states. Um, so I'm just proud that so many people want to have the same model going on locally to them because the mission here is to provide space for deaf people to be able to play with their language in a safe space. And we've truly made that happen. And that's our greatest accomplishment. Make more art, make more poetry, come on. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh... Yeah. And, uh, so my advice would be to look at all the different mediums of art we have in movement, right? There's poetry in sign language, uh, there's some things that are there's some question about the ability to publish sign language, right? I would ask for the recognition of sign language. People have said that if sign language poetry is published, then it will gain the recognition that it deserves. And so it's not often looked at at the same level as written poetry. But we can make a video, but then somehow, how do we include uh, the world that doesn't understand that video into it to recognize it as being published? So look at the movement as, as the art. The yeah. 
performance as movement is equal to the written word on the page. So I would like to see that happen from the community at large, that recognition. Uh, yeah, um, that, was, that was my last question. Um, it, it was great talking to you. Um, and, and I hope everything, everything's going well um, with everything going on. Um, but thank you for your insight. Um, Great. Yeah. No, thank you. Thank you for uh, choosing me to interview. I'm honored. I really appreciate it. And thank you. And stay safe. <laughs> you too. And thanks, Flip. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> All right. Take care.